morning we're starting in chapter 13. <clears throat> and if you remember last week, at the end of last week, uh, our lesson, uh, this uh, Herod, you know, Peter had, uh, he had uh, escaped from jail. And uh, when Herod couldn't find him, he had wanted the uh, soldiers put to death. Then he goes on, puts on all of his kingly apparel and sits on the throne and uh, the people start giving him all this praise and calling him a god and he didn't give God the praise. He took it in moment for himself. So the angel of the Lord there smote him with worms and eaten him alive and he gave up the ghost. And then it tells us that uh, Barnabas and Saul returned back from Jerusalem back down to Antioch. And this is where we're at today. <coughs> Starting at verse 13, it says, uh, verse 1 says, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simon, that was called Niger, and Lucas of Serene, and Maon, which had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. Well, they several of them are, wasn't they? There at the church. So I went to look up these people that we're talking about here, just who they were. <coughs> so uh, this Barnabas, if you remember, Barnabas was a, uh, a disciple of Jesus. In Acts 1, starting at 21 and through 23, he says, Wherefore these men, which have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us to his resurrection. And they appointed two, Joseph, called Barnabas, who surnamed Justice and Mathis. So what they were doing, they were filling the empty position left by Judas, there the, the twelfth apostle, and of course, you know, as they casted their lots, Mathis is the one that got the vote, and Barnabas didn't. So he was been a disciple of Jesus all along. Now there's Simon that was nicknamed Niger. History tells us <coughs> that a dark man, dark complexion, or African descent, Niger in the Latin word means black. So this guy, of course, he's dark complexion. He was just called a nickname as Niger. Believed to be Simon of Serene, father of Rufus, that was named in Romans chapter 16, and the same Simon in Mark 15 and 21. Now in 15 and 21 tells us this, And they compelled one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by coming out of the country, the father of Alexander of Rufus, to bear his cross. In other words, <coughs> Simon here was the one that helped, that bared the cross for Jesus to the, up on the uh, Mount Golgotha, on the, there where he was crucified. So he was involved in all this too, you know, well known about the Lord. Lucas of Serene, a uh, history tells us here that Lucas was one of the first bishops of Serene. According to Michael Lee Aquin, the French historian and theologian, listed St. Lucas among the six early bishops of the city there, the country. And man was a teacher in the first century Christian church at Antioch who had been brought up with Herod Antipas. And then, of course, you know, Brother Saul, we all know about Brother Saul, but I couldn't find nothing about him that would tie him in and knowing or, or being brought up around with uh, King Herod, with Herod there. Okay, so now that these men here, 
It's all assembled there at the Church of Antioch, right? So we've got teachers and one there that's bishop and, uh, you know, disciples and, and all. So well-trained, well-informed people here. So in, in verse 2 tells us that as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work unto, unto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So, they're given an a, a evangelistic mission, ain't they? To go out and start spreading the word further out. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Cilicia, how do you say that? Cilicia. Cilicia, and from hence sailed to Cyprus. Well, from Antioch to Cilicia is about 16 miles walking, but from Cilicia to Cyprus is about 130 miles by ship. So that's a pretty good distance to sail. But really not, really not all that far. So, uh, these guys were traveling quite, quite some distance to do, uh, to do the Lord's work, aren't they? In verse 5, it says, And when they were at Salamis, is that what he said? Salamis. Salamis, okay. They preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had also John to their ministry. Now, in history... Many scholars trust that John, the cousin of Barnabas, is the same person as John Mark, and also believed to be Mark the Evangelist. So since he was there and they added him to it, so maybe that's true. You know, I mean, that would be true, I believe. I, the way I understand it, anyway. And number six says, And when they had gone through the Isles of Paphos, and they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar Jesus. Which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man. Now prudent here means having good understanding. Who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the words of God. But Elimus, the sorcerer, for so his name had been interpreted by, you know, or we stood them seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Now this we stood to stand against, to re, you know, to oppose them, to turn them away. <clears throat> then Saul, who also is called Paul. Now, right here is where we have the name change from Saul to Paul. Paul was the birth name of Saul was the birth name of Paul before he was converted to follow Jesus, being baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost. There, of course, we've all we've read that story there in chapter nine, and <clears throat> changing his name to me, you know, here would be somewhat would be more uh, suitable to me, to the man, because he has had a life-changing experience, right? He has been brought from, from being one character of the Bible to a complete different character. Paul meaning little one, and his conversion was somewhere around 34 A.D., and that's about the time, the time of his conversion and his trip to Damascus in history kind of coincides being, you know, one another being, backs one another up. <clears throat> Since then Saul, uh, who also was called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. Now, when we talk about setting your eyes, that's that firm look. You look nowhere else. You set your, you, nothing else matters. You're looking at that one particular thing. Okay, see what happens. And Timber 10 says, and said, O full of all subtlety, which means deceit, guile, and all mischief, thou child of the devil, 
thy enemy of all righteousness. Will thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? Well, it looks like here that Brother Mr. Alimus or Bar Jesus just confronted the wrong man, ain't he? Mm. He says, and now, number 11 says, Now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist, a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Well, then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. You know, seeing the power of the Lord that was present there with Paul and Barnabas, and the deputy was amazed at what he saw the doctrine, seeing the doctrine of Christ, you know. So, I'm saying... So I guess that closing the mouth of Elimus, okay, and blinding him allowed the deputy of freedom to think for himself for a change, you know, to clear it, you know, get all this confusion back. That's what Paul did for him, wasn't it? The Lord moved it to where the deputy could actually hear and not have that interference, okay, and putting this child of the devil, as Paul called him, out of the way, put him behind him. Oh, yeah. Man. But you know, that, <laughs> yeah, but this is what we need to be doing ourselves, you know, today. Uh, uh, we need to rebuke the devil and put him behind us. Every time he tries to attack you anyway, you got to stop him right there. Don't give him a, don't give him a, not one inch. So we can do our own thinking, and allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what builds us up more in our life and in our mind, serving the Lord. You know, we're a more positive attitude about this. You know. Uh, <clears throat> And that's what really strengthens us in the Lord and service our Lord is having that positive attitude that what we're doing and what we're thinking is right. And we only have that when we have the Holy Spirit working in us. But you can't do that when you've got that thing up here on the wrong shoulder talking to you, right? you got to put him out of the way. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> boy. Okay. Okay, said so 13 says, Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, and they came to Percusus in, yeah, whatever, and John departed from them, returning to Jerusalem. Now, from Percusus there to Oh, uh, well, let's see. They loosed and sailed to Pergus, uh, one of the places there, was about 185 miles. Since then, John, he went back to Jerusalem. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us how John traveled back from where they was at. You know, they traveled quite a bit, Jerusalem. And so I went looking and uh, Googled it. And I thought, well, you know, about the only way I couldn't get no miles on the, I've got a, a Bible atlas, but it shows you on the Bible, but it don't give you the inches and the miles scale you ought to go by. So, now in today, and we're talking about in today's life, if you was to travel that distance that John had to go back, if he went by land, 906 miles. And if you was to drive that in a car, that's 18, over 18 and a half hours. 
Now, unless he sailed back the way they came, which you know, say it doesn't say, but you're talking about a lot of you got on about a lot of days traveling, yeah, didn't you? Uh, I think it's kind of interesting to know how dedicated these men are in getting the word of God spread, the travels that they made, that they that all the that they went through in order to get the job done. And it's hard even anymore to get people to get in the car and drive 10, 15 minutes up to church or 30 minutes, you know? Yeah, make a 30 minute trip. That's okay. 15. Let's see, no, 14. Let's see. But when they departed from Perth, they came to Antioch and Persida and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. Now, <clears throat> That miles from the, from there to Antioch was like 120 miles, and of course that was one they walked. <clears throat> and after that, and after the reading of the law and of the the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, "Ye men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on." So you know. If strangers came into the church, you know, and they recognized one another and all, of being who they are and probably maybe energy, they know that they're there for a specific reason. They're not, because back then, you know, people traveled by foot. They just didn't come by chance. These people traveled, so they knew that the, you know, the uh, people in the synagogue knew that the guys were probably there for a specific reason. So, <clears throat> 16, and says, Then Paul stood up and beckoning with his hand and said, Men of Israel and ye that fear God, give audience. In other words, listen to what I've got to say. So right here, Paul is fixing to give them a history lesson. And if you know, remember, Paul was well trained in verse. You know, he was a real educated man because he trained with uh, the Pharisees there, the uh, big teacher there for when he was younger, and he knew the Mosaic laws. He knew all the things in the old in the old scriptures and all. So, anyway, him being real, so he's fixing to give him a history lesson here. She said, "The God of this people, Israel." chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt and with a high arm brought them out brought them out of it. So in other words, when God brought them out of bondage, okay? And about the time of 40 years suffered their manners in the wilderness. So if you remember they wandered in the wilderness 40 years because of their disobedience to God. If they hadn't have done so, they wouldn't have had done that, right? right? 19, and when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he divided their land by lot. You know, remember, Joshua caused, and the Egyptians crossed Jordan there. And when they went in the land, the armies that he took with him, you know, they numbered the, the number of people, men from 18 on to so many age, to be in the fight, you know. And they went in and took over the, of course, God led the way, you know. He was there with them, helping them win the battle, right? <clears throat> 20 he said, and after that he gave unto the, said, and after that he gave unto them judges about the space of 450 years, until Samuel the prophet, and after, and after they desired a king, God gave unto them Saul, the son of Sis, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, by the space of forty years. So, <clears throat> if you notice here, when they asked God for a change, He gave it to them, didn't He? He, he heard them, He answered them, you know. He, You know, that's the way it is today. You ask something of God, and you know, you know it, it, that's right. You know, God will hear you. God will hear you. 
God hears you talking. Okay? Let's see, where am I at here? 22 and said, And when he had removed him, he raised up unto him, them, David, to be their king, to whom also gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jess, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. <clears throat> so God sure truly loved David. And uh, God said David was a man after his own heart and would fill his will. So David was pleased. I mean, God was pleased with what he seen with David because David was, a, was not only just a simple man, a boy that feared, not only was true to his father, and, you know, and God knew him by heart. And God knew his heart, and he knew it was right. Twenty-three says, Of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised up Israel a Savior, Jesus, through his seed down through the years. From him came our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Right. When John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, and as John fulfilled this course, he said, Whom think ye that I am? I am not he, but behold, there cometh one after me whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to loosen. So, <clears throat> in Matthew chapter 3, 13 through 17, tells us this. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, and saying, I have need to be baptized of thee. And you cometh to me. So, you know, he didn't understand why the Lord with Jesus would come to him because John knew exactly who he was when he seen him, didn't he? You know, that's uh, the Holy Spirit working within a man. It gives you the knowledge of understanding, you know. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Suffer it to be so, for it thus becometh us to feel all righteousness. And what he was saying here, that because you're baptizing the others, you need to baptize me. Let everybody see what's right is right. And I'm no, you know, he, he just didn't thank him of being anything different, right? Then he suffered him, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, lighting upon him. So that was the answer you know what what John knew the Lord verified when he sat had the spirit set down on him, didn't he? he knew. Beyond the shadow of a doubt, right? <clears throat> Twenty six says, Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of of this salvation sent. So, that's the reason that they were there, wasn't it? They brought the word of salvation to them. For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew not him, nor yet the voice of the prophets, which read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning and condemning him. Little did they know that these people that was condemning him was actually fulfilling the written scripture that was to happen. And, through, and though they found no cause of death in him, yet desired they Pilate that he should be slain. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But God raised him from the dead. In Acts 1 and 3, it tells us this. 
to whom also he showed him, well, I've, done, I've missed one there somewhere. Okay, up here. So Matthew 28, 5, 6, and 7 tells us this. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that you seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where he laid. So, what was written, Jesus told them that, and that it was fulfilled that what rise that uh, God did raise him from the dead. And Thirty-one says, and he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. And Thirty-one said, but. In Acts 1 and 3 says, To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. <clears throat> so, what he wrote here was already taken place, right? And Paul knew, and he explained it. And God hath fulfilled the same unto us, us their children, and in that he had raised him up, Jesus again, as it is also written in the second Psalms, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. In other words, in the beginning, God's the only son that he begotten was there before the foundation of the world. And and the second time here, when he allowed him to be crucified, to die for our sins, he also raised him from the dead. He's begotten him the second time, right? Back to life. But this time, totally different, right? And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now is no more to return to corruption. He said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore he said also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thy holy one to see corruption. <clears throat> And the reason that he did not get to see corruption again, because he did raise him up, didn't he? Not only did he raise him from the dead, he ascended him back to heaven, didn't he? And Acts 1, 9, 10, 11 says this, And when he had spoken these things, while they yet beheld, he was taken up, and in a cloud received him out of the sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up. Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which, al which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing into heaven, this same Jesus, which you have seen taken up? Into heaven shall, all, shall, all, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. So in other words, he is taken up into heaven where God is. So he will not see corruption anymore, right? Because there is no corruption. There is nothing up there except righteous, pure, clean. Which thing? Right? I'm looking for that day, aren't you? Amen. I'm just... There's nothing going to be there that's going to aggravate you. Nothing there that's going to cause you pain, sorrow. The one that you've missed, that's gone on before, is going to be there. Whew. I get excited sometimes, don't you? I do. For God, after He had served His own generation by the will, had served it for David 
after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on asleep, and was laid unto his fathers, and saw corruption. But he whom God raised again saw no corruption. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. You know, <clears throat> Jesus told them that he says, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father but me. In Ephesians 1 and 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. It's the grace of God. Well, I've been given the five signs, so I guess I just time to shut. You know, we'll talk it, speak it up next time. You know, and this, <clears throat> it has been so well looking up all this stuff, where these people are, who these people, <clears throat> who these people are, what, who they were that the Holy Spirit, the Lord, had sent on these trips, evangelistic trips, the mileage that they went in order to achieve these goals, you know, and everything. <clears throat> and to uh, know of the, the amount of people that had been uh, received of this. And just a little bit later here in the chapter, how... Saul tells them that uh, since they have refused to accept the word of God, then the Lord has sent them to go to the Gentiles. And since they have judged themselves, you know, and that's the thing. You start judging yourself, you judge yourself wrong, you might be condemning yourself to go in the opposite direction, right? You've got to think about things like that. Don't take the role of something that you're not supposed to be. God didn't make you a judge. He wants you for a disciple. Amen. Okay, Keith, you're to close our class out today.